I'd really just like to start with a topic that is top of mind for everyone these days, and especially during the pandemic, that is education. So what is your take on how the pandemic is affecting students' ability to receive a quality education? It's, uh, you know, look, we're, we're a very diverse country. There are places that we're prepared for, not necessarily the epic pandemic that we're going through, but uh, tr have been training to deal with crises. For example, in, you know, the 67 school districts of Florida, they, they had to prepare for hurricanes, most of the counties. And so there's, Florida probably did a better job because there was actually a, a plan in place to go online pretty quickly. It wasn't perfect, but uh, learning continued. Other places uh, didn't do so hot. They, they, they didn't do, have the training. The teachers um, weren't really trained on how to teach online. Uh, there was, there's big challenges in broadband in rural areas huge challenges there uh, where 40% of all uh, rural residents in our country don't have access to high-speed broadband. And so districts that were nimble, you know, had to, did a lot of really creative things. They, they brought, uh, put Wi-Fi in buses and put them, created hotspots in neighborhoods. Um, think about all the Title I students that uh, were relying on breakfast and lunches at the schools. The schools had to respond to that challenge. So in this extraordinary emergency, um, it was a mixed record, I'd say, and I think it's still a mixed record as we go into the fall season. The danger is districts and states that default to inaction. There should be a bias towards action. Uh, thankfully, we now know that younger kids particularly um, are less susceptible of getting the infection and transmitting the infection. Uh, and if, if teachers have pre-existing conditions that make them vulnerable, then they can zoom into the classroom perhaps uh, but, but education has to go on. If we go two years without accountability and two years, basically one and a half years without, without a command commitment, particularly for lower income kids, the gaps that exist will be devastating for their lives. In addition, sadly, there's all sorts of other health and mental health, uh, social issues of being quarantined in your home. Um, and, and so I hope the debate goes beyond the hyper-political, hyper-partisan nature of of whether we should open up or not and think about uh, a bias towards opening and doing it as safely as possible and having flexibility to be able to deal with it. Here's one thing that I think we should, should never accept. There are school districts in this country, and I'm, I'm sure that West Virginia didn't have any of these districts, I hope and pray that's the case, that said, because we can't provide uh, learning to everyone, we're not gonna provide it at all. That's shameful. Um, that creates this, you know, this inequity in, in um, our schools uh, and in our society that, that um, is not American to me. And so uh, kudos to the teachers and administrators that figured out how to do this, and hopefully they will inspire those that didn't do so well. Thank you, Governor Bush. I know as governor of Florida, uh, you faced so many state level issues, but really always made education a top priority. Uh, could you talk a little bit about why it was and continues to be so important to you? Well, um, I just think it's, it, it, and even more so today than when I ran uh, in 1998, it, it is the path forward for people to have the chance to rise up. Without a quality education, particularly where we're moving towards, right? with um, uh, in, you know, massive disruption caused by innovation, technology, just cascading into our lives. You have to have a high quality education to be able to be successful in life. And in 1998, that was the case as well. Um, I was, I was, the views that I had were considered, I think, radical back then. Uh, but basically, I believe that every child could learn and that we should have real accountability around every child and the school should be take, you know, held to account. There should be rewards for improvement and excellence. There should be options for parents when there's failure. Um, we should end social promotion in third grade, and there should be parental choice across the board. That was kind of what I advocated. I went to visit 250 schools in 1998, and I saw firsthand the incredible successes that existed and the, and the miserable failures. I'll never forget, I was, uh, back then, Florida proudly had an eighth grade level high school graduation test. 
Um, most states didn't even have a high school graduation test, believe it or not. And so uh, I, was, I was watching this kid in a, a computer lab. That was back when the screens were like green, you know, instead of the fancy <laughs> computers, looked like Pong machines. Uh, and this kid could not answer the following question. A baseball game starts at 3, it ends at 4.30. How long is the game? And it just, you know, you think about a kid who'd been in the K-12 system for 12 years and could not answer that question and was going to take the, this eighth grade level test to graduate from high school, and he couldn't answer it. And so my guess is that his life has been limited. And, and that motivated me to stay the course for real accountability, parental choice, uh, a, a command focus on the lowest performing kids to make sure that uh, they could catch up. And the result was that Florida, and this should, this should inspire the leaders that are participating here today, because we were on the NAEP test, which is the nation's report card. West Virginia was higher than Florida in 1998 in the fourth grade NAEP test. Uh, we, were, we were 29th out of 31. Fast forward 10 years later with all of these reforms, and trust me, it was not a happy time. I mean, there, there was a lot of controversy around this, and people were quite upset that the big, you know, governor was messing with the status quo. And the net result was we went from 29th out of 31 in the fourth grade uh, NAEP test to sixth out of 50. And Florida, historically now, from that moment on, has been uh, a leader, particularly for low-income kids, kids of color, kids with learning disabilities. Florida's in the top five. And we are, we have 58% of our kids are uh, qualified for free and reduced lunch. So it can happen. If you move the needle, if you're bigger and bolder, it can happen. Kids can learn. And I, you know, it's so frustrating in 2020 to hear people say, well, life circumstances make it impossible for some kids to excel. I think God's given every child the ability to learn and it's up to all of us in the business community, philanthropy, certainly inside the K-12 system to organize ourselves in a way that they achieve that uh, God-given talent that they have. Thank you. And just to sort of build on that, you know, today the Education Alliance is kicking off a three-day education summit and we're focused on early literacy today. So I know that literacy has been a cause championed by your family uh, for decades and you pushed for a comprehensive program focused on early literacy during your time in, uh, in Florida, your tenure there. So could you talk a little bit more about what that entails? Sure. Um, I guess any of these strategies that uh, you all will consider in West Virginia should be comprehensive. There's no one magic bullet to uh, achieve the, the goal of, uh, of literacy by the time a child enters fourth grade. But it should be the aspiration of everyone in the state because that is the first building block without a question. And we were really passionate about it because um, those gaps are hard to overcome the older a, a student gets. And in fourth grade, as we all know, you're, you're learning, you're reading to learn. And so pre-K to three, you're learning how to read. And so what did we do? Well, we, we created a gate. I know that's controversial. Uh, we actually ended social promotion. If you were below a below basic reader, you were functionally illiterate, there had to be another strategy implemented for, for that student. Um, you couldn't go to fourth grade. Uh, we had a, uh, you know, we were the first in the nation to do this. And the net result was that there was a command pre-K to three focus because there was an outcome that would be different if, if there was abject failure for that child. So what did we do? We, t we put reading coaches in every school to teach teachers how to teach reading because our schools of education sadly don't do the kind of job that, that you would expect. Uh, we, we brought in mentors. Uh, and I was happy to see that the power company uh, is focused on mentorship. We created a BHAG, a big, hairy, audacious goal of 200,000 mentors. And we focused on third, struggling third grade readers. We, we allowed high school juniors to come in and mentor uh, in the feeder pattern. Uh, we had businesses that would give their um, employees one hour a week to be able to mentor. The state government did the same. We got school districts, reluctantly, many of them, they were kind of grumpy about it, but the school districts uh, did the same thing. And we, in, in three years time, we went from 100,000 mentors to 206,000 mentors 
particularly focused, and we, we funded Big Brothers and Big Sisters, uh, the Boys and Girls Clubs, uh, all of these, this army of people that were focused on helping teachers uh, break this, this, uh, this chain of failure that existed. And the net result was with, with uh, you know, we have universal pre-K, voluntary pre-K, and then we had this K-3 strategy uh, and teachers motivated and trained and, um, and a gate at the end that's, that really was a, you know, there wasn't a lot of loopholes attached to it. That's why we uh, became one of the leading uh, achievement uh, st states in the country. And, and other states are now doing this, you know, and the ones that do it are going to be the ones that see an acceleration of, uh, of learning. And who benefits from this? It's the kids that are always tragically left behind. We're in a, we're in a period of our history right now where people are demanding social justice. They're marching in the streets for social justice. And I, I'm, I'm all for that. But rather than just march and talk about it, the way you really create a just society is to deal with these achievement gaps at the earliest age. And so I commend you all for focusing on this because it is extraordinarily important. Imagine a kid who doesn't, can't read uh, at, at, at starting fourth grade. What happens is those gaps grow almost exponentially. And you can link prison populations, you can link uh, uh, lower wages to how a child, how a child is, is learning how to read by the end of third grade. If they can't read by the end of third grade, the outcomes are tragic. If they can, they have a fighting chance to live a purposeful, successful life. So if you had to pick one thing, that's the one I think would be hugely important. Thank you. And I know you've sort of called out some of the uh, negative outcomes that can happen if a, if a student is not uh, literate and cannot read by third grade. Could you talk a little bit about the positive impacts of your, your policy in Florida and some of those uh, positive outcomes? Sure. Um, I think we did a, since this, you know, look, these reforms have been in place now for uh, 20 years. There was the 20th anniversary was was last year actually, and so and and Florida um, was a little ahead of the game as it relates to the collection of data. So you can track a student's outcome, K pre K to 12, uh, and then you can track that student's college level. You know how many credits they got in college and if they graduated, and then you can attract you can track their income levels and jobs. And we've had enough time now for um, all of that to become clear. And the net result is that um, we have, I think we have uh, 200, like six years ago, we had 250,000 kids that graduated from high school capable of going to college that otherwise wouldn't if we stayed the same. Now, you know, that's a big deal to me. It's, it's why I stay involved in this. Um, you can move the needle if you stick with it and have dogged determination and really, and really, you know, be passionate about this to convince others this is an important thing to do. Think about the lives that are saved when you, you're, you're college ready or career ready, which is another element, I think, a new strategy that has emerged across the country that's, you know, the aspiration ought to be college and or career ready when you graduate from high school and hopefully have college, have a nationally recognized certificate under your belt, as well as um, college credit under your belt. That would be the next BHAG if I was a governor right now. Thank you. And that really brings us back to our summit theme. Uh, we are all connected. So I think what you're saying is that early literacy is not just something that we focus on early in a student's educational career, but it impacts really their entire life. Absolutely. And I, just a tip of the hat to my uh, now deceased uh, beautiful mother, Barbara Bush. Um, this, is, this should be lifelong. Um, there are a lot of adults in our country that are, you know, have struggled with literacy as well. And the first teachers of our children are parents. And so family literacy is also important. There's lots of ways that um, the communities can empower uh, families by teaching mom and dad how to read better so that they could teach their children how to do the same. Um, you know, look, we're, we don't have the luxury of leaving people behind anymore. We just don't. 
um, the demands that are placed on society uh, because of illiteracy, the demands placed on our criminal justice system, on uh, the transfer social service transfer system, on our healthcare system, you track all this stuff and it's compelling. But if you can lessen illiteracy, you're going to expand opportunity and lessen the demands on government. So um, I, I, you know, I, I think there's lots of ways to skin this cat and um, hopefully people will be motivated to be engaged themselves. I kind of find it uh, a little depressing these days that people, now they see a problem and they, they either think it's impossible to solve or maybe in their own lives they just don't have the time or they're frustrated in their own lives so they don't engage. We need to be engaging again in our communities. We need to make a difference in the lives of our neighbors um, and, and our family members. And hopefully, you know, in this crazy political world we're living through, just watching it unfold, um, I mean, it's, it's wacky. Maybe people will say, I'm, I'm gonna start taking care of the things that I think are important. I'm gonna add value to, to the, you know, the lives that I consider to be valuable. I'm gonna make a difference and I'm gonna roll up my sleeves in my own community and not worry about what's going on in DC. Well, I can tell you that um, we're so thrilled that we have so many citizens and uh, business, education, uh, policymakers that are engaged because they're uh, with us today for, for today's webinar. We've had a fantastic response. Um, we've talked a, a lot about Florida and some of the policies there. I'd like to sort of transition and just uh, ask if there are any other states that have seen the same strong outcomes when it comes to early literacy policy? Yes, um, I would say the best, the shining example in the country doesn't get much attention because, you know, the, the, the people that opine about a lot of this education stuff are on the, on the coast, they're part of the so-called coastal elites. <laughs> so they don't, they don't focus on Mississippi, but Mississippi has been um, doing phenomenal work, starting with uh, Governor Bryan and now with uh, Governor Reeves, uh, the legislature and the governor have uh, really implemented some pretty bold reforms. They have a phenomenal superintendent of education and they have a K-3 strategy, a pre-K to three strategy that they've implemented. And lo and behold, and they have a no social promotion policy for fourth grade and they're, fo they're really focused on training teachers. Lo and behold, the NAEP test last administered, I think last year, uh, Mississippi, uh, for the last two NAIC tests, the two, um, three years ago and last year, Mississippi has been uh, top two in the country in terms of, of learning gains. Everybody's got a long way to go, but implementing these, these early uh, childhood literacy programs that they have, have made a huge difference. I'd say North Carolina is another example where the legislature and the, the governor's office um, uh, have, have made a command focus on this, this effort as well. There's a, there's a lot of interest in this across the country. I think the key is to make sure that you, you have accountability around it. You know, one thing is to say, I wanna have a pre-K program, but it ought to be literacy based. There ought to be a consequence. There, there ought to be rewards for success. Um, I happen to think that uh, the end of third grade, there should be, you know, there should be remediation if, you, if, if, a, if a child is functionally illiterate, because we, we know the direct results uh, that happen when, when, a, when a child is not ready to, to learn in fourth grade. So um, I'd say North Carolina and Mississippi are probably the two best examples, but I know a lot of other states are focusing on this now. Thank you. Thank you for those examples. So circling back to the pandemic now, we know that there is going to be learning loss associated with the time that students spent outside of school and the different models of reentry. So amid COVID-19, how can states really prepare their third graders to read to learn in fourth grade? Well, what they can't do is to say, uh, you know, life's not fair, we're not gonna do the test. <laughs> That's just a disaster. That's what, you know, obviously, when we shut down our schools in March uh, across the country, the test for this year was not, not, um, not appropriate uh, because of the crisis, but there should be no default to do the exact same thing next year. Again, the people, the kids that will be most hurt, the students most hurt will be those in uh, low-income communities across the country. So 
Um, the Federal Department of Education, I don't believe, will be giving out waivers to say they're, you know, it's okay not to have a test. I think accountability is really important. Uh, my, my experience, we had eight hurricanes and four tropical storms in two years. Uh, counties, the school districts were devastated. I mean, Charlotte County and the southwest coast of Florida lost half of the schools. I mean, they, they weren't even operational for two months or three months. Um, and they came seeking a waiver for the, you know, the test, uh, end of year test. And I respectfully said, no, um, you can rise to this challenge. And they did. And they actually um, had uh, incredible outcomes because they did rise to the challenge. They, they, they didn't default to doing nothing. They, they, their bias was towards action. And so I think, I think that's got to be the, the strategy. We roll up our sleeves together. We recognize that this is a challenge, but you know, we act on it. We, we, we know it's important. If we, if we allow, if we quarantine ourselves for a year and a half, um, waiting for a vaccine, kind of in the fetal position in the corner of our homes, the, the social costs of that are so high. The mental health challenges are extraordinary. The child abuse and domestic abuse and drug abuse, we've seen it, it's, it's increasing. And yet there are people that say it's not fair, we should have no accountability, schools shouldn't open. You know, I, I just, I respectfully disagree. Let's open and be safe and develop an adaptive strategy uh, and let's maintain our accountability system so that uh, particularly the low income kids that are typically just cast aside have a fighting chance to be successful. I know here in West Virginia, our schools have been doing everything in their power to, to open. And so we're really appreciative of those efforts. And um, I believe that we are going to have time for a few questions from our audience, uh, but I do have one final question on my end before we transition. And you sort of touched on this. When we think about equity and access, especially in light of the pandemic, what else can we be doing to ensure academic success and preparedness for, for all of our students? Yeah, so we've, uh, at, at, at uh, the uh, foundation that I had, Excel and Ed, we have uh, refocused our strategies to, to answer that question, at least for our, the efforts, our work product. First, um, and this is something I'm really passionate about, uh, we need to bridge the digital divide. But the, we're not gonna be, you know, the pandemic will, will leave at some point, you know, we're going to get a vaccine and we'll be, we, we're not going to go back to normal. We're going to be in a new normal. And part of the opportunity would be that um, if you can work at home, if you can receive healthcare at home, if your children can be educated at home, it's going to give you a huge leg up. And so low income communities and rural communities need to be uh, need the infrastructure to be able to take advantage of that. That is, to me, the biggest equity issue in education today. So developing a national strategy implemented locally for the digital divide is a top priority. Second, I think what you all are focused on today has to be a, a huge priority, dealing with these learning gaps that start at an early age and have big aspirational goals to, to narrow those gaps uh, as quickly as you can. Third, um, I think we need to start trusting parents a little bit more, not tell them where their kids should go to school, but empower them to be informed consumers, to be able to have a multitude of choices, not just one. And um, this is a place where I think West Virginia could, could probably do more, both public and private. To me, public education is educating students. It isn't the system that we you know, bow down to. It's, it's empowering families to make sure their children are successful. And I trust parents a lot about um, their kids' future. They love their children with their heart and soul. They should have more say on where their kids go to school. Then this new strategy of pathways for both college and career, uh, which is a huge economic development challenge and opportunity. I think states have really begun to embrace that. Frankly, it's one place where there's, there's Bipartisan support. It's one of the happy little places in policy world where it's not a big food fight going on. And then finally, we're living in 2020. The world around us is just, you know, the innovation has exploded into our lives. Uh, the combination of big data analytics, artificial intelligence, um, 5G, autonomous, this stuff is not going to go away. 
And uh, we should embrace the things that will enhance the learning experience, not view it uh, as a threat, but embrace it so that, you know, we, we move to a data-driven um, system of learning that, that accelerates the learning process for everybody. So embracing technology rather than fearing it, I think, is the fifth pillar of what a proper strategy ought to be. Thank you, Governor Bush. Uh, I think we have uh, our first question from our audience. Uh, just sort of following up on your, your comments there, can you talk more about the pathways to college and career? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm as you probably can tell, I'm, I'm into um, aspirational goals. I think people, you know, people will believe that it's possible to move the needle in life if there's a goal and then you have a strategy to, to, you know, to, to, to make that goal come true. And the goal ought to be college and or career readiness for every student, which means embedded in your accountability systems. In Florida, for example, um, we have a, we grade schools A through F and the uh, schools get bonus points for students that pass AP classes and IB classes and classes that have embedded in them nationally recognized certificates of some kind so that they, they have evidence that they have mastered that skill that will allow them to, to uh, be qualified for a job. Um, and when you incent the things that you want more of, you get more of them. Uh, we bonus teachers for AP classes, for example. So I, I think we need to move away from this idea that you're tracking someone towards a technical career or you're tracking someone to college and meld them together and give them the optionality of both. Um, and so it should be one track with diverse offerings where there's rewards for this, you know, in terms of the accountability system where, where you, you know, you put incentives in place to get more of what you want. Um, and look, if 25% if of all juniors in the United States in high school are, are capable of taking college level work and only 3% do, there's a gap there that we could fix. If, if uh, and the same gap exists as it relates to um, pathways towards a career. So why don't we accelerate the learning process? The kids are smarter than we give them credit for. Um, the senior year in high school is not the most, it's a, it's a social year effectively. Um, and, and maybe there's ways to accelerate these, you know, college readiness as well as career readiness uh, in your senior year, and you can still have fun. You know, I'm not suggesting that everybody in the whole world needs to eat their broccoli every day and all that. I mean, high school kids are going to have fun, but, but they should be motivated uh, to be able to, uh, to be on a path of where they're, you know, they're learning things that they're passionate about, and that will accelerate their learning in a really dramatic way. As the mom of a high school senior, uh, my son's in 12th grade this year, I, I can just say that both as a parent, as an, as an educator, that is what I want for my son, to have that, that vision, that passion for his future that really propels him to uh, college and or career, as you said. Um, our next question from our audience, uh, I'd like you to talk a little bit more about what sanctions and rewards, if any, did you find uh, most effective in Florida for the accountability measures? Well, we, as I said, we grade schools in a totally transparent way, A, B, C, D, and F. Half on learning, half, half, half to the standards and half on learning gains. That's the simplified for reading and math um, and, and, and with a focus on the lower performing 25% of every school. So that's kind of the accountability system. And we added benefits uh, for improvement. So if your, your grade went up a grade or uh, was an A, you, the schools got $100 per student directly to the school. So if you had 500 kids, that's 50,000 bucks, right? I mean, it's a nice reward. 90% of that money, by the way, went to bonuses, particularly to teachers in the school. So teachers were rewarded for a job well done where there was improvement or excellence. Uh, that's one way to reward. Um, the, the, that's the carrot. The stick would have been um, if you're F, your parent, parents can choose other, you know, better high performing school or a private option. That was the incentive and disincentive. And we got a lot less F schools and a lot more improvement because there was a carrot and a stick. 
And as it relates to social promotion, we, um, we had a gate. And so uh, the first year we did this, 30% of our kids were level one below basic the year before. And we cut that in half to 14%. 14% of kids in, in like 2002 were held back in Florida. It was controversial for sure. But the research has shown now that those kids that were held back have actually caught up with the kids that were pushed along that were relatively close in terms of their learning gains. And so while it's controversial, um, it had a dramatic positive effect on lessening the number of kids that were functionally illiterate. Uh, and, and I guess the other lesson I would say is accountability by itself isn't enough. You need to, you need to like push um, the, the efforts to assure that there's a better outcome. So once you create the accountability system that's totally transparent and you know what the rules of engagement are, then it's important for policymakers to be able to implement strategies to improve it. Because a, a below basic reader is not gonna become a functionally literate reader just on their own. There has to be a strategy around them. We have to teach teachers how to teach reading. There should be summer schools when appropriate or other means by which you um, that are appropriate for the communities in, that, you know, where the students exist to be able to develop these strategies for success. And that's the experience in Florida. It's not perfect. Um, our gains have not continued. They've kind of, I mean, we're still a national leader, but I'd like to see Florida be competitive globally. I don't, you know, why would we aspire to be top five in our country when Florida, in the United States is a middling country as it relates to uh, education outcomes. We should be number one. We should aspire to the best. Thank you, Governor Bush. Um, one of the unique things about our summit is that we have a very diverse audience. Uh, we have uh, educators with us today. We have uh, community members, policymakers, and business leaders. So we have a question. I uh, hear, do you have any suggestions for ways the business community can advocate and help uh, early literacy policy? Yeah, uh, you can lobby the legislature. Not just, you know, what part of our success uh, from a policy perspective was that the, the, the Florida Chamber, the other business groups were actively involved in advancing these reforms that at the time were considered pretty controversial, but they were all in. So instead of just going to talk about tort reform or tax policy or regulatory policy in the, in the state capital, uh, they were talking about that for sure. And I was generally a supportive, of, you know, I was tr hope, you know, trying to be an ally to build a better business climate, but they were, great supporters for all of the initiatives that we undertook, uh, particularly early childhood literacy. And then, you know, if you can organize a mentoring program that's statewide and make it something that's cool to do. I mean, State Farm, for example, 25% of all of their employees were mentoring uh, an hour. They had, they had what, I think they had like 6,000 employees in uh, Winter Haven, Florida. 25% of them were mentoring. Um, and some of them actually quit their jobs and became teachers because they were so empowered by the idea of helping struggling readers in third grade. So you can mobilize support with school districts as well. Um, by the way, school districts at the beginning of all these efforts were not, they resisted people coming on campus. But then they realized, why, what, what am I doing this for? I mean, by and large now, uh, we have much more open uh, systems where um, people can come help. Uh, and it does make a difference. I'm, I'm totally convinced that. Thank you. And just sort of building on that, um, another question from the audience. Can you talk about how uh, communities can really empower family literacy? You, ta you touched on that earlier. How, how can we really empower family literacy to impact um, students? Well, there, the Barbara Bush Family Literacy Foundation, you should go to the website and see um, what they do. Uh, they support these grassroots efforts across the country. They're, they're all over the place where, um, where there's efforts underway to, uh, to, to do exactly that, to, to empower families to be able to be the first teachers of, and first readers to their children. So um, get in, there's, that's one way to get involved is to 
enhance and strengthen those, those, uh, those programs that exist in West Virginia. Um, you know, look again, it's an important element of, of uh, the challenge we face. We, we don't have the luxury, given our demographics, we don't have the luxury of saying, okay, we, we're, if you can't read, you can't get a job, we'll just have to deal with it. We need to empower everybody to be successful in this country now. So um, I think businesses can be involved in uh, providing financial support for these grassroots efforts. Uh, there's one of the things that, uh, I was the chairman of the Barbara Bush Family Literacy Foundation and um, I suggested that the uh, foundation create an X prize for adult family literacy, which they did. And Dollar General is a big supporter of these efforts. And so if you go on site, go online, you can see these, um, where these programs exist and maybe make a difference uh, in the ones that are in, in the, you know, in your neighborhood. Thank you. And so uh, this is the, the last question that we have for you from our audience today. Um, and I know you've talked about various uh, approaches and strategies and also that long-term commitment that you've had in uh, Florida and other states like Mississippi. So um, the question from the audience is really just acknowledging that there is going to be pushback. Um, so what strategies did you use to that were successful to really um, deal with pushback and, and garner support um, when you're working on these policies? It's a great question because uh, what, I, what I learned was that the first wave of reform, you have to execute. You can't just pass a law and check the box and then go to your other favorite food group in the policy world as a, as a public leader. You, you have to stick with it, show dogged determination. Um, and, and success will protect the programs. Failure will stall them out. So the first wave of reform, it is essential that, the, that, the, that it's successful, that you communicate what the expectations are, and then you execute on a strategy to achieve that desired result. And then what happens is that, that um, success then creates opportunities for more reform. And look, you're either moving forward or you're, or you're going backwards. There is no stand and pat. And so what I learned was the reform is never final. And you, know, you have to constantly be pushing the ball uh, forward. And, and I think that's the lesson for the, my successors as governor and the legislatures of Florida as well. They've not stopped, they've continued on. And so dogged determination, um, like just fill in the space, playing offense, uh, taking risks politically. These things were not popular when, they, when I started. They, it's not that they were unpop unpopular, they were controversial. Um, and now I think there's a, too many politicians in the world we're in now, they, they view the downside risks of doing big things as greater than the, um, you know, the, the, the possibility of success. Uh, and now with social media, you know, everybody, I don't know, I, I, I find it remarkable. We have so many great challenges in our country right now. And, and instead of saying, oh, woe is me, um, what we should be saying is these problems are huge opportunities to improve the life of people. And you know we need a lot more gladiators out there, whether in the private sector or public sector, or you know appropriately probably uh, public-private partnerships to do these things. But we don't. We should have a sense of urgency. There should be no complacency. A, a kid in kindergarten today in West Virginia, if if they are a functionally illiterate fourth grader, I can tell you where they're going to be. They're going to be in a low-income job, or they're going to be in prison. Period. What, what do we want? I mean, is that, is that what we expect? Uh, we can change, we can move the needle on this. We can change the direction of our country if every community rises up and says, we're not gonna let this happen anymore. So I don't know, I, I, I would hope that um, that passion to improve the life of, of your neighbors is something that would be uh, really purposeful. And I hope, I hope people really stay engaged and, and don't have any tolerance for you know, inaction. Thank you for that challenge. Uh, thank you for the reminder to, uh, to all of us to 
uh, really address this challenge as an opportunity and to be hopeful for the for the sake of our children. Um, we're we're so appreciative of your leadership and your advocacy and. Uh, we have a small gift for you on behalf of the uh, West Virginia students here. We just have a small West Virginia gift for you. Oh, here it is. Very nice. <laughs> well, it's not virtual. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Well, again, Governor Bush, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are, are thrilled uh, with all of the insightful uh, information that you shared with us and we look forward to taking action on your advice. Thank you and thanks for all the work that the Education Alliance in West Virginia does. We appreciate you.